Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode 34, The Lost History of Angkor. Angkor, along with its most famous temple, Angkor Wat, is one of the most unique places in the world. The French claim that they discovered it when Cambodia was part of French Indochina. But like so many theoretically lost places, it was always known to locals. However, much of our current information about the historical events from the city comes from inscriptions and other artwork on the temple. And because of the jungle climate Angkor is in, much of the rest of the information about the city is gone, possibly forever. Yet for everything that we still don't know about Angkor, we do know this. It was the largest pre-industrial city in the history of the world. My guest today is Drew Varenkamp. He's the host of the Wonders of the World podcast. He's back for a second time on the show, and we talked this time about the known history of Angkor, how tourism at Angkor has changed dramatically in the past two decades, and how Cambodia's ancient Khmer capital and more recent historical events under the Khmer Rouge make Cambodia one of the most interesting places for a history lover to grapple with. All right, my guest today is Drew Varenkamp, the host of the Wonders of the World podcast. And I twisted your arm last time you were on the show talking about the grand place to come back and talk about Angkor. And you're back. So thanks for joining me. Boot. Glad to be here. Thanks. So we are talking about Angkor. I think a lot of people confuse Angkor and Angkor Wat. Semantically, it just gets confused. Do you want to explain what the difference is? It happens with a lot of places. Like I think of of the Vatican, for example. It's really easy to conflate the Vatican and St. Peter's. But St. Peter's is just one part of the Vatican. There's a lot more. And Angkor and Angkor Wat are the same sort of thing. Angkor Wat is the most famous temple within Angkor. But Angkor itself is the remnants of a giant city that um, at its time was the largest city in the world. Um, I think at its peak, one out of every thousand humans on earth lived in Angkor. That's crazy. Yeah, it's wild. So we have this massive city that's sort of lost in the jungle, and then you have Angkor Wat. And so Angkor is Khmer for capital city. And so Angkor Wat just means capital city temple. Okay. And that was the, the big, the, you know, this, the most popular one. It was the largest one. It was the one that people jumped to. It's the one that people think of when they think of Angkor. They think of the, the pine cones of, of Angkor Wat. It's the silhouette on the Cambodian flag. It's the symbol of the country. Uh, it's the thing you've seen. But there's so much more to Angkor than just the Wat. So let's talk a little bit about your experience there. When did you go to Angkor? Um, 2002. So back then, Cambodia was just getting back on the map. It had been um, sort of a no-go zone for all sorts of reasons, mostly war-related and landmine-related for years. That is something that I don't – I didn't realize until I got there. I said – okay, that is – People should drink every time I say that on this podcast. I didn't realize until I got there. But that's part of why I like wanted to do this podcast is I feel like uh, history just is different when you are standing there and hearing the stories from locals and when you like have to do the logistics yourself. But Cambodia is still covered in tons of landmines. And I want to do another episode about the Khmer Rouge and um, circled around like Phnom Penh and S21. But just so listeners are aware, what happened in the 70s is still playing out in the country in terms of there are, there are people that are still injured from landmines that were that were planted. I don't know exactly what the correct term is for a landmine, but right. they were buried during uh, that period. And uh, where Siem Reap is, which is kind of, it's by Tan La Sap, it's kind of closer to the north, um, is still very much in the middle of where there were a lot of landmines and we, and we still don't know to this day where all the landmines are. Right. And that's, it's to the point you still have to, you know, keep to trails and 
I went to Cambodia, came from Cambodia from Vietnam, and Vietnam had cleared everything, and that they had from left over from the Vietnam Vietnam War, and when you cross the border, you see Vietnam is completely green, and Cambodia was completely brown. Oh wow! And it was like it was so clearly evident because in Cambodia you could not farm those fields because you did not know, you know, or irrigate. You couldn't do what you would do for maintenance for the, the rice paddies because you didn't know if you were going to get your legs blown off. And the minesweepers are expensive and slow. It's a slow process. And I, and, and it's also a prof- problem that's affecting Lao too, because, and that's le- more so from uh, unexploded bombs dropped by Americans, but uh, all over Southeast Asia, there are some problems with this. So, and, and 2002 is, so much earlier than I, I, I think we had a hard time grappling with what happened even until this decade. But uh, in the nineties, Americans weren't always on the right side of politics when it came to the Khmer Rouge. So 2002, that's an interesting time to have been there. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was so different than I think it would be now. And I'd love to hear your experience now because um, you were just there. Like Siem Reap, which is the little town, it's not the gateway town to Angkor. There was maybe one or two sort of Western class hotels when I was there. I stayed in a guest house for four dollars a night, so I doubt that that's still <laughs> that cheap. Um, so my guest house was a pretty nice one, but it but it was only twelve dollars a night. Uh, you could get like full hour massages for about six dollars. Uh, I mean, Cambodia is a very inexpensive place to travel in the first place. Now, Siem Reap is very touristy now, and it is um, an economy that is completely catered to outsiders. Um, Now, that doesn't necessarily mean Western tourists. You have tons of Asian tourists in the area, too. But there is a whole section of the town that is just Mexican restaurants, Italian restaurants, like places for foreigners to be. And um, I know Cambodia really needs this tourism. And I think the tourism there has, I want to say it's like tripled in the last three or four years. It's like crazy. It's really picked up. And it's, uh, you know, they get at least 2 million people a year now going to Angkor. And, you know, again, when I was there, it's just, you know, 15 years has passed or whatever. But uh, it was, there weren't many of us at all. I think, you know, we went up to the top of Phnom Bakang, I think, for um, to see the sunset. And there may have been 50 people, like Westerners. And I think you can go now and it's, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds uh, on a given day. Uh, we'll put a link to the uh, I, uh, a link to the video that I took that I posted on Facebook. Like I did a Facebook Live from Sunrise at Angkor Wat, like specifically at Angkor Wat. And <laughs> you could just see the swarms of people. I think probably... The main difference with visiting today versus when you were there is just like, I think Instagram has really changed the way that people travel, not necessarily for the better. And uh, there were just so many people there just trying to get pictures of themselves in interesting places. And that was kind of hard to see because, I mean, I travel to a lot of very famous places. I, I And I travel with – sometimes I travel with, like, Instagrammers who that's their whole job. And it is interesting to watch them, like, do their poses backwards looking over a cliff or whatever. And I used to not think that that stuff was that bad, just kind of boring. But after Angkor Wat, I actually have had a hard time posting on my Instagram account because Angkor was just so – so many people trying to get the perfect Instagram picture, and it just drove me a little bit crazy. Well, and the problem with that is it's all the same perfect Instagram picture. Oh, completely. Like, everyone takes the same picture. They all go for the same money shot, at which point you produce nothing of added value or creativity. So <laughs> No, I, uh, I just... Uh... I love my, I used to, and this is, we'll get back. I promise guys, we'll get back to the history, but it is just something about modern tourism. Instagram has changed it for, for the better in some ways. Like I found places that I wouldn't know about otherwise, um, but for the worst in a lot of ways. And I'm trying to recalibrate what my responsibility is when I put images up there. Like, uh, for example, last summer I went, uh, to Corpus Christi and my uncle has a boat. 
and we went swimming and there were dolphins. So we went, we were swimming, literally swimming with dolphins, but I didn't want to post a picture on Instagram because I didn't want to encourage people to go find dolphin tours, which are not ethical. Whereas like, if you just happen to be swimming there and a dolphin comes up to you and your uncle gets a picture of it, that's like a very different experience. But because people see my account, I didn't want that out in the world as like a thing that people should strive for. Like, even though personally the pictures are cool for like my family to see. And I'm right. just, I'm kind of been after being at Encore and, and being in this amazing place and seeing so many people just look at it from a visual perspective and not dig into the history of it. It really did just kind of like shake me. Uh, it shook my faith in humanity a little bit, um, but definitely like been rethinking what my responsibility is. I haven't answered that question yet, but uh, yeah. So if you want to know if it's more touristy today, it was the most touristy place I went to anywhere in the Southeast Asia during my entire month there. Partially because unlike Bangkok, there's not that many reasons people go to Siem Reap. They go specifically to go to Angkor. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, so this is this is going to be, again, we should get back to really talking about the place, but that's going to make me sad because on the one hand, I totally understand Cambodia is an incredibly poor country. And if you have the opportunity to bring in hard dollars from outside for tourism, take it, like absolutely take it. But on the other hand, like it was so magical to be able to explore some of these temples and literally be the only one there. It was just me and like the motorcycle guy who drove me, you know, like right in the back of the motorcycle takes you to the temple and you're in this famous temple built by Jayavarman and you're just um, in the jungle and you, it's just you and these incredible ancient ruins in the jungle with sounds of all sorts of critters all around you. It's a shame that that's lost. So I would actually say it's not that it's lost. It's that it's not at Angkor anymore. Like if you're going to go to Angkor and all you want to do is get a really beautiful Instagram picture and see the, this really famous place, then that's where you want to go. If you also want to have that magical experience of being maybe the only Westerner somewhere and having all the other tourists in that place be locals or uh, Cambodians, I would say there are two other UNESCO sites that I, where I was alone. And one is the Temple of Priya Vihir. And probably when you were there, it was not accessible. It's uh, about a four-hour drive from Siem Reap. But you can do both of these yeah. as a day trip from Siem Reap. Because it, it's on this one is on the Thai border. Like, until 2015, it was disputed violently <laughs> between the two countries. So uh, it was very difficult to get to. And uh, when you, like, my friend had to do four hours on a motorbike to get there. And when you did get there, there are, like, bullet holes in the temple, um, but it's uh, same time period as Angkor, and uh, there were Asian tourists there that clearly weren't Cambodians, but there was no other English speaker that was there the whole time I was there. So that was probably a similar experience. And you get to look across the border and see uh, Thailand and Laos at the same time. So yeah. if you're looking for undiscovered magic, I would go to Priya Vihir. And then there's another place called Sambor Prey Cook, which is not quite as stunningly beautiful as Priya Vihir or Angkor. But it was a very important pre-Angkor city. And the only people that were there when I was there, there was one tour bus of Asian tourists and uh, a family who had dressed up, local family who dressed up to do like wedding pictures there. But other than that, I was walking through these like, um, they're like almost like beehive shaped temples, octagonal temples. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a bunch of them. And it actually means like many temples in the splendor of the forest. So, and both of those areas need tourism dollars just as much. So if you're listening to this podcast because you're planning on going to Angkor and you feel like you need to add a little bit of solitude on your trip afterwards, go to one of these two other places. But yeah. obviously you can't skip Angkor. <laughs> I think too, there's, Angkor is so big and there are so many temples and so many places that you probably can find those that are just less off the typical circuit of somebody who's spending a day there. Yeah, you'd have to get, I think if you get there early and you get there really early and you just keep going, it's a really long day. And so about one o'clock, people start tapping out. And so you can probably be at like a further out temple more alone in the afternoon still. And on, if you go back for a day two or a day three, you can start at temples nobody even wants to see. Right. Now that we have... um thoroughly discuss this it's i mean i think it's important though because 
it is one of those places that the world it has an over tourism problem and it and, and you know it's not just places like venice you know although venice is a seriously over touristed place and over tourism is an issue i don't think cm reap is over touristed but i do think people should just be aware that how they behave there as tourists matters to other people's experiences too because you're not for the most part going to be alone so let's talk about why people historically should go <laughs> instead of just if you if you want a pretty Instagram picture, you'll get one there. But what let's talk about the history behind it so that history lovers understand why it's still a place that they should want to go. So, again, it was the capital center city of the Khmer Empire, which generally peaked from about 800 to 1300, 1400 A.D. and was just this massive successful kingdom in what's now Cambodia, but also included uh, most of, of Laos and the Mekong Delta and most of Thailand at its peak. So it was, it was, it was pretty significant in size. But what made it really amazing is, is how big Angkor was. So Angkor, the city, um, again, was the largest city in the history of the world before the industrial era. And by large, I don't mean population, although, again, it was huge, right? It had one out of every thousand humans at, at the time. But it was so big an area that the area of the city, connected by roads and canals and irrigation systems, was about 390 square miles. Um, that's part of why they do sell, like, three-day passes and people plan – to go for two or three days just because it is so big. There's literally so much to see. And also why people tend to go by hiring a tuk-tuk driver um, and had to have the, to, have to quickly be able to get between temple to temple because there are other ancient cities, like I went to this place called Sukhothai, and I did just walk. There are some people that biked and some people that did tuk-tuks, but it is small enough that you can just walk. Uh, I would not do that at Angkor. <laughs> no, I mean, so if you think about it in perspective, right, the city of Angkor, the entire city of Angkor is bigger than the current city of Paris, right, the 20 arrondissement of Paris. It is 30% bigger than New York City, the five boroughs of New York City. It is double the size of the city of Chicago. Which is crazy when you think about, like, the fact that we lost it. Like, we didn't lose, like, locals didn't lose it, but the outside world lost it, right? It's it's just like with, like, Petra, like, locals never lose anything, right? They always know where those things are. But, like, people in the outside, it's, there are, like, reports of, like, the Chinese talking about uh, Angkor, and then there is a period where people don't know, where outsiders couldn't tell you where it was if a local didn't take you there. So, when it was founded, it was a huge city, but it was also built over time who were some of the earliest rulers that were there yeah so we don't know when it was first founded as a as a city and, and generally what would happen over time would be they'd build a city and then maybe there would be an invasion or there'd be a fire or something would happen or the king would just change his mind they'd build a new city nearby they kept building in the same general area but they would build sort of new cities on top of each other and, and then it sort of filled in the gaps all the, all the way around uh, the first one the first main ruler that we know of that really created the, the Khmer Kingdom was a guy named Jayavarman II. Um, and this is about 802 AD. So obviously there were people before because he's the second Jayavarman. So there's <laughs> been an earlier Jayavarman. And, uh, but Varman kind of means king, basically. And um, in Khmer, and Jaya was actually a word in Sanskrit. So Jaya, if people have been to Angkor, if they've read anything about it, Jayavarman is a name that is... You will see a lot because we're starting with Jayavarman the second, but yeah, all the way to like Jayavarman the seventh are important people that we're going to be talking, or the, some of whom we'll be talking about. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to talk about you know, three that just stood out to me. Um, Jayavarman the second kind of started it off, started the ball rolling. He declared himself God King um, and created this this kingdom, kind of carved from some smaller states that had been in Cambodia and then uh, sort of separate from. The kind of the Vietnamese on one side, then Cham down in, in the south, and then the uh, uh, the Thai to the west, and so sort of carve out this sort of space in the middle as a, his own kingdom, and um, was able to to thrive at that point. And so, at the beginning, 
the, the, the religion, the way the religion sort of interplays itself through is fascinating because the Khmer built their temples in stone, but they built everything else, including their royal palaces, in wood. And so because it's the jungle and things decay really quickly, uh, we don't have anything of, of the palaces or the houses or the daily life or any remnants of that. All we have are the temples because they were stone even though the stone came from like miles and miles away and they used more stone to build the city of Angkor over time than the Egyptians used to make the pyramids. Oh, wow. I did not realize that. And the pyramid stone is right there. Like the quarry is right there. But here they had to bring it in and from, you know, almost near the, the Loetian border. Which is four hours away by car. So you can imagine in 800 AD how difficult a journey that would be, especially through the jungle, especially without real roads. Well, and they used water for everything. Like The water transport was so big. And even today, maybe 15 years later, it's not. But in when I was there in 02, the roads were all awful, 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 awful. Like the roads had been built in the 50s, had been bombed, and hadn't really been fixed. So all the transportation I took, um, or most of it, around Cambodia was by boat because the, the rivers were good. Well, that's actually one of the things that's that. Um, so the the road to Siem Reap is very nice from Phnom Penh because that is those are the two most important cities in the country, and they want people to be able to get back and forth between them. So I took a bus in between those, and it and was totally fine. It takes about six hours. I think it cost me like ten dollars to get between the two, and like a private air conditioned bus that was like had like eight passengers or ten passengers. Um, the road to Priya here, that is the road to the border, was bad a few years ago and has only recently been updated. And it is now uh, like a fine road, but that is very, very recent. Yeah, wow. So that's they really have improved that then because like you could you could take you could go by car up, but it was gonna take you forever. So it was just so much faster to take a boat. You know, so it was about, you know, like I think four or six hours. By People boat still to take get... boats in but not at this time of year, so not in the winter because the water is too low. But they will take boats in the summer, and um, that is a really popular way to go. It was really nice. It's very pleasant. So, yeah, so they, the water was really, really important um, to the, the, the ancient Khmer as well because it was an uh, easy way to get around. You, know, you didn't have to clear up jungle or anything like that. You could just sort of use the waterways um, and the irrigation was so important to be able to uh, support the population and support the agriculture. But again, so they built these temples of stone uh, because religion was so become such an important facet for our understanding of them because we don't have as much of the rest. Um, so when they started, the Khmer were Hindu and specifically Drive Arm the second focused on worship of Shiva. So in Hinduism, there are three primary deities. There's Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. Now, we think about that as, from a Western perspective, as destroyer must be bad, but it's not. Um, Shiva's not chaos. It's not evil. He's not, um, you know... Like Satan, right? She, he is, or like a Loki figure, or like a right, yeah, nothing like that. Um, he brings the transformation that you have to have to renew and start again, right? Okay, it's almost like the fire of a phoenix. Yeah, yeah, you know, kind of rising from the ashes, right? Um, so it's sort of a cleansing fire. It's sort of a clear out the dead wood, if you will, so that you can start fresh, right? Um, you think about it from an agricultural perspective, you've got once you, you harvest, you have to clear the ground again so you can plant anew, right? And so that's really where Shiva comes in. And uh, Hinduism and, 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 the, and the worship of Shiva was the big business until we have a new king coming along in the first half of the 1100s named Suryavarman II. Suryavarman II is cool because he's got, um, well, that's really funny, apparently. When you say Suryavarman the second, Siri thinks you're talking to it. <laughs> oh, modern technology. I hope that uh, Siri doesn't get 
called by like I hope no no listeners end up having Siri called when we say uh Siri Farm in the, the second. <laughs> so he has a story that's really similar to a lot of the great kings of history. Like he's a minor royal from a provincial backwater. He takes on his elders, um, and his ineffective great uncle sort of leads the charge. And there's an inscription about him that says, Leaving on the field of combat the ocean of his armies, he delivered a terrible battle. Bounding on the head of the elephant of the enemy king, he killed him, as Garuda on the edge of a mountain would kill a serpent. And I just love that because I have this, I love this vision of like a young prince bounding on the head of a raging boar elephant. <laughs> and it's like, that's really cool. <laughs> And yeah, it's a really it's, good movie. So many of these stories, I mean, first of all, we just don't have the like personal backgrounds of a lot of them. So many of them we only know through inscriptions, the way that we know like most of the Sumerian leaders through like inscriptions and not we just don't have all the cultural other stories that you want to fill in the characters, which is right. why the temples are so important. Because it is just, it's, you know, it's what we have. So much of what we have are like inscriptions of battles, depictions of battles on the walls. I mean, so many of the temples are just covered in battle scenes. And then also we have um, their faces because their faces are very important in the temples, especially, uh, I mean, there's a whole temple that is just basically the face of the king that built it. And so it, it makes it both a very personal experience, but without the social fabric that you want to fill them in as people in the way that like Henry the eighth is a person to a lot of us. Right. But Henry the eighth is a person to a lot of us, but like William the first isn't right. Yeah. So like you go far enough back and the English Kings get sort of like, well, yeah, it was there. fought some battles, did some things and died. I and mean, it's not quite the same level of detail that we get when we get into the Renaissance and afterwards where we just have so much more preserved. But I mean, think about this, like Alfred the great, was a contemporary with the earliest of the ink workings. And I think Alfred the Great has been humanized because there were, you know, we have like the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. And wouldn't it be great if we had the Khmer's version of that? And we just don't, right. you know? It's not really one of those things where it's probably going to be found. I mean, maybe it's hidden in the clay pot somewhere, but most likely not. No. Yeah, probably not. I mean, it's not... This isn't the Dead Sea, right? This isn't a desert, you know, Egypt or, or, or the Holy Land where things can be preserved in a cave forever because there's no wetness. I mean, this is the jungle. <laughs> well, and that it, think about like how much of our biases as like inheritors and like lovers of history. It's like so much of what we love is just because there's enough information to be told the story. And right. there's nothing that was like culturally more advanced if you look at like the Anglo-Saxon versus the Khmer's um, from the Anglo-Saxons, but the climate makes it so that you can keep. And the fact that it was like far away enough from the center of so much of what, like of where the chaos was at the time means that some things just get preserved. But the right. Khmer empire was just as advanced, just as powerful, but because of the climate, we literally don't have their stories, but then that gets translated not translated, that gets passed down as almost like they weren't as important when it's like, no, they had different weather. Right. Well, and, and again, I don't want to get off topic too much, but they just made that discovery in Guatemala about how massive the Mayans really were because they did that LIDAR and they used that same technology in Angkor to be able to kind of find other temples and really understand how big the city was. But this, So LIDAR is, they fly a plane, it's like low altitude radar, and they just fly a plane really low over the jungle and sort of just bounce things off and really get an understanding of what the topography is like underneath all the trees and the debris and the dust, dirt and the soil and everything else. And once you clear all that out and you get a view of what's actually there, they see just tons and tons and tons of structures and roads and canals and all these things that were built by these civilizations. That's amazing. The, and and so they they discovered it in Guatemala just how massively extensive the Mayan were. I mean, it was just mind boggling how huge the civilization was. And for so long, there was this notion that well, you go to Guatemala and you see the people there now. They clearly couldn't have built these pyramids. It must have been aliens. 
<laughs> right? Yeah. Which is so, such an awful, awful concept. Yeah. Uh, to think. Well, racist hey, concept. It, right? <laughs> Pure racism. You know, because we don't have the same level of stories. But, you know, you kind of think about how, what could the Khmer have ended up becoming if they had had the time without the outside pressure. And we'll get to that at the end. But also, you know, what could the Native Americans, the, the Maya, the Inca, the Aztec, the Toltecs, have become if they hadn't been obliterated by disease? Yeah. You know, in the, in the late 1400s. Oh, history. <laughs> Some of those counterfactuals are interesting to think about, but it also it's just like it's really important to confront your biases about what history is important and think about how do you know this history? Who decided it was important? What were the like cultural, what were the physical reasons? Like what climate led to the fact that you even know this? It's just not, you know, what country put money into finding something versus because archaeology isn't free. I mean, they're just, it's, we don't have the stories that we have because they're the world's best, most interesting stories. We have them there because they're the stories people want you to know. And it's just important to think about that when you, so it doesn't mean you shouldn't love the stories because some of them are amazing, but just remember that, that it's not, it's, it's not right. necessarily a meritocracy of like historic figure. <laughs> right. Right. So Surya Varman uh, became the king and he thought Shiva was okay, but he preferred Vishnu and felt that Vishnu needed a temple for him because all these other things were Shiva focused. They needed to be something really special for Vishnu. And he then built or had built, Angkor Wat, right? The largest temple in Angkor built for Vishnu. And it's amazing. It's like I said, we said before, it's the one you think of. It's the one that's remarkable, but it's really cool because it combines the old Khmer architecture and the new Khmer architecture, or like the earlier and the later. So early Khmer architecture is very similar to Mayan architecture or to original Egyptian architecture. It's pyramid based, right? They're building mountains or representations of mountains. So the uh, you know, Angkor is flat. Cambodia is flat. It's a flat, flat country. And so any mountains they have have to be man-made. But the stories are the gods live in the mountains. So you've got to build a mountain <laughs> somehow. And so they build these mountains. And so the, um, you know, in the middle of Angkor Wat are five immense towers on a raised platform that represent Mount Meru, the kind of the mythical home of the gods. And they're really amazing towers and they're like lotus petal. You call it a pine cone, but it's, um, you know, they're really intricately carved and uh, kind of just magic, majestic in the middle. But around them, what was new that Angkor Wat provided and what would become essential to the later temples are these galleries um, these long hallways all, and walls all the way around the temple that are carved with the stories. And they're carved with the stories of uh, mythology. And they're carved with the history of the king as well. So you can follow them along. And these, I, I never know if it's, it looks like bas reliefs. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's bas relief. But, so American his American art history classes will say bas relief, and that's fine because we're not French. But if you, it is a French term, I believe, and you would say it. I will never pronounce it correctly, but that's fine. Uh, but yeah, in, in like if you go to walk into an art history class, they would most likely just say bas relief. Okay. <laughs> anyway, they're basically statues that are carved into the wall. They kind of project from the wall, and then they tell all these stories. And, and paint scenes and, and give a view of life both in heaven and on earth. And so they have the churning of the sea of milk, for example, this amazing scene of all the gods and the devils and the angels and the animals and everything um, at the story of creation. And then they'll have other ones showing um, bits of personal life. And my favorite are actually at um, a temple we'll talk about later with Jai Farm in the seventh, um, where they actually show like, daily life in Angkor. And it's, it's really cool. So after Angkor Wat is built, 
Do subsequent kings stay with Vishnu as the main deity? A couple do, but four kings, the three kings after Surya Varman are um, kind of weak and, and insignificant. So the fourth king after him is Jayavarman the seventh. Okay. And he changes everything, right? So he actually um, decides to follow Buddhism. So completely different, out of out of left field. He brings Buddhism in. He's influenced by his his mother, I think, and her sister, um, or something like that. And so he's uh, really into the, the concept of Buddhism and Buddha, and and buys into all of that. And he decides he's the most powerful king in Khmer history. And he decides he's going to completely kind of rebuild everything. Um, for for Buddha, so he builds a brand new city just north of Angkor Wat, called we call now Angkor Thom, and it's this giant walled city with um, an immense temple in the middle called the Bayon, which we'll get to, as well as two other amazing temples that he built, one called Taprom, and one called Preah Khan, and they are all amazing to visit. So. He builds, so if you, the standard um, tourist path through Angkor, you see Angkor Wat, and then you see Angkor Tom and these temples that Jai Varma the Seventh built. Now, a couple of them, uh, Prey Khan and Taprom, have been left in a semi restored state. I would say Prey Khan was probably one of my favorite because of that. Like, yeah. um, if there, so, and I haven't done a good job. Like I said, when I was in Angkor Wat, it kind of killed my Instagram spirit. So uh, I have not um, gone, like, I have a bunch of photos from that trip that I need to go through. And I, it didn't kill my love of photography. It just killed my wanting to put it on the internet for a little while. So I need to go through it. I'll put in the show notes for this on my website, all of my pic not all, but pictures of some of these different places. And Priya Khan. When I went in, there was like a Buddhist statue. So first of all, you have to dress respectfully because these are still living temples. Right. Um, and like, I, you know, so I got up, I went to did sunset at Angkor Wat, which is really common. Then you go inside and there are Buddhist monks who are also visiting as part of just their life. And then there are some Buddhist monks who are doing ceremonies there for tourists or with tourists and there are buddhist statues around so even if like you take off like a lot of times girls will wear spaghetti strap shirts and take off their jackets in between places but they'll make you put them on before you go and then priya khan when i walked in had like a buddha statue that just had one of the most beautiful displays and i do think that's one of the photos that made it up on facebook at least um and it just felt completely magical and and by that point i had lost most of the other tourists so i would say yeah. definitely a highlight for me personally Praya Khan is really cool because it is it's far enough out and far enough away that people don't make it there and it's it's really impressive and it it and Tuprom are both really impressive because the jungle is still in the temple. And so there, it's almost um, a symbiotic relationship. You have these incredible trees growing from the walls, you know, and you have, you'll have like these, uh, these, there's these statues of these dancers. They're all over the various temples of Angkor called Apsara dancers. And they're basically Khmer girls dancing statues. And, uh, you know they're very very graceful and nimble. Almost like a have. Greek chariot's head, not exactly the, the, yeah. the but like if you've seen like a Greek temple, similar concept of like why you would have these around. Right, and just they're just so they're so lithe and so um, bendy, <laughs> but they're really <laughs> really nice. And then you'll have these trees and vines all around them, and and, and uh, you know kind of dancing with them. It's just really cool. It's it's sort of like, you know how Art Nouveau has um, no straight lines? Yeah. You get that feeling from these temples because the trees and the vegetation sort of naturally curve. And when I was there, Angelina Jolie had just been to film the Tomb Raider movie. And now they're making a new Tomb Raider movie. So it shows what happens. <laughs> uh, but that to prom, um, 
was where it was filmed, and it does. It feels so Indiana Jonesy and and Tomb Raidery because it's that. It feels like that temple in the jungle, kind of that you 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 expect from those kind of adventure movies. Well, I, and I will not be ashamed to say that, like after visiting, I definitely uh, watched Tomb Raider because I didn't I didn't watch it before because I was like I don't want to watch Tomb Raider. But then as soon as I was there, I was like, okay, well now I want to see how they portrayed it in the movie. Like, and it was actually uh, the movie held up better than I thought it would. Yeah, yeah, it's not not terrible. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> um, so so those are really cool. Again, just to 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 see these um, the way the jungle interacts with the rock and the stone and the, and the and the artwork. The Bayonne, which is in the middle of that ancient walled city of Angkor Tom, is maybe my favorite because it's Jai Varman the seventh. A kind of masterpiece. Jai the Seventh, Buddhist, loves Buddha, wants pictures of Buddha everywhere. The fact that Buddha happens to look just like Jai Varman the Seventh, <laughs> pure coincidence. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so, it's his face is everywhere. I mean, like his face is on the gates to get into places. It's, but like when by the time you pull up to that tomb or to that. Um, by the time you pull up to that temple, you see his face, like, burned into the back of your eyeball. You will never forget what Jaya Varma the Seventh looks like for the rest of your life once you've been there. It's, which, good job for him. That's exactly the kind of propaganda that he was trying to do. <laughs> there are 216 ginormous faces of Jaya Varma the Seventh all over this temple. And the temple is, it's big, but it's not that big. It's just... It's everywhere you look. There he is. There he is. There he is. It's kind of big brothery, but uh, you know, it's uh, everything in moderation, I guess. Right? <laughs> but my favorite thing about the Bayon Temple are are the the bas reliefs, because there's um they're really well preserved. But they also cover there's a, a a bunch on the religion, and they're maybe not as good as the ones at Angkor Wat. They cover like the mythology and the and the story of the, of the creation. There are others that are all about like life in Angkor that are fantastic. There's like bas reliefs of guys making beer. There's bas reliefs of guys drinking beer. <laughs> There's bas reliefs of cockfighting. There's bas reliefs of you know eating and and, and partying and um, getting on boats and and just living. That is so compelling. Oh, because you don't usually see that in, you know, ancient religious structures. <laughs> so after Jaya Varma the Seventh comes in, and I, you know, I think most people who love history are used to hearing the idea of kingdoms having a great king in the middle that does a lot, and then what happens after him? The whole thing collapses. <laughs> And that's what's amazing is, is that normally, yeah, you have the great king and then you have a slow decline afterwards. This decline came really fast. Like within a few decades, Angkor was basically gone. Um, it had, there was a massive war with Thailand. And for listeners, um, I recorded an episode about uh, Bangkok and the Kingdom of Siam and the kingdom that we talked about in that, the, the Kingdom of Siam that was based and headquartered in Ayutthaya is the is who they're at war with in Thailand. Right, that's the one, Ayutthaya, and they just crushed them. But at the same time that happened, Buddhism had happened. So the problem with Buddhism is there is less deferential or less deference to authority than you have in Hinduism. So Hinduism, you have the caste system, you have a lot of structure and a lot of, you know, you do what the king says. And there's less of that in Buddhism. So if you have a really, really powerful king, it's fine. But if your king is kind of wishy-washy or troubles are afoot, people are less inclined to listen. And they, there's a, a, a – archaeologists are still trying to figure out what happened to Angkor. But there's one theory that people were just, you know, hey, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and build your canals for you. I've got other things to do. And – 
people sort of did that. And when you didn't don't maintain the canals and the infrastructure, the jungle takes over. And so people sort of spread out and went their own way. Um, my favorite theory, though, besides the war and the religion, is climate change. Because we're still understanding how much impact climate has had on world history. Things that we just assumed, well, that just happened, turn out to be climate caused. And this is the case here. I think, unfortunately, we're still, we haven't even really figured out how much current events are affected by climate, yet alone reevaluating all of the things that happened in the past. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. So they, they've been uh, studying tree rings and things, and they find that in around the 1300s, so Jaya Varman the seventh was uh, end of the 1100s. Okay. So by the 1300s, the monsoons had dried up. So there were massive droughts. And then the monsoons became really irregular. So you might have dry, 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 then massive flooding. And dry, 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 massive flooding. And the infrastructure couldn't keep up. When the warming period ended and the climate shifted, Europe made it through. But civilizations like the Khmer the Maya, the um, Anasazi in southwest United States, all took a hit at the same time. And they all collapsed at the same time. Because of the way that we absorb history, right? Which is like one story here, one continent for this year, uh, one country for this class. It's I would have never stepped back and looked at like what happened like that across the globe at one time, like in, in my head, all of those things are separate places. There's like, right. there's no connection in my head across those civilizations. That is so interesting. Yeah. They all, they all did really well. And then they all kind of started to collapse, you know, kind of in similar time periods. And, um, and, and so that's, you know, when you take that step back and speak, Oh, wow. Yeah. And so that's the theory of what happened to Khmer was that they were riding a really nice wave of climate. Uh, and when that failed, like with the Roman Empire, nice wave of climate, when that failed, you have dark ages. And you had a dark age in Cambodia uh, that happened at the end of the medieval period. That is really scary for uh, thinking about where we are in terms of like current world events. Um, because I think it's scientists are universally sure that we are going to undergo rapid climate change in the next hundred years. So and it will be interesting and uh, terrifying to see how that plays out with mm -hmm. the different political structures in our lives. Yes. <laughs> so many times I'm interviewing someone and it's like something from the past just, just, it just sounds too close to what's happening now. And I just have to stop and be scared for a minute. <laughs> so after the Khmer Empire falls, uh, what is it replaced with in Cambodia? So after the Khmer Empire falls, it disappears from history. And obviously, like we talked about earlier, locals know where it is. They're aware of it. But the age of colonization with the French and the British they all go looking for these ancient places wherever they go. And just like with Napoleon and the Rosetta Stone, uh, you and I talked about Petra for your show. Um, the French come in and they get interested in figuring out what the Cambodians already know. <laughs> and that's where this place is. But what, what was that process like? Yeah, I mean, the French were the ones who kind of came to Cambodia and claimed Cambodia. And um, and sent their archaeologists out to uh, to kind of see, you know, are the rumors true? And mainly looking, again, kind of like the Spanish did in Latin America. If we find any gold, that'd be great. <laughs> and uh, and they didn't because, again, yeah, it hadn't been lost. It was still – people were still living there. People still lived in Angkor um, at the time that uh, the French came by and so uh, – showed up. But they, they were amazed to find – these kind of statues and, and, and temples in the jungle and started this process throughout most of the 20th century 
or the early 20th century, I'll specify that, um, to restore primarily Angkor Wat to something resembling its original state, and then less so with the other temples. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a painstaking process to clear the vegetation and then keep it clear and then and kind of rebuild. Did the French do in Angkor what so many colonial powers did and trek? So did they trek a lot of it back to France or did a lot of it stay? I mean, obviously with the building, the building stayed, but do, do they find stuff, artifacts or other important discoveries and keep them in the country or did they move them to France? That's a good question. I don't, yeah, there isn't, you know, because again, so much just doesn't last in the humidity of the jungle in the tropics. So I don't think they had as much, um, I'll put it this way. I don't, I don't know of a whole lot in Paris that is of Southeast Asian origin. There's not a whole lot at the Louvre or in other museums. I think there's, there's one museum on the, on the left bank that has some, but I seem to remember it's more being remaining in country. And I think some of that comes from Cambodia not being an official colony, but being a protectorate because they maintain the royal family. Yeah. The, um, well, we're, we'll cut. So my goal is to do an episode on the Khmer Rouge and that's going to be a whole hour and we'll definitely cover how they got in power. And it has a lot to do with the country's disillusion with the monarchy at the time. But right. do, how, when the Khmer Rouge were in power, they were, so we're talking in the early seventies or no, we're talking mid seventies, 75 to 79. Um, when they were in power, they created a completely atheist state in, in officially, obviously people can believe in their hearts, whatever they want, but what, and and they were very anti monasteries. They were very brutal to the monks. What happened with Angkor during that time? Um, landmines everywhere, mostly. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, so much of it's so weird. You you go to Phnom Penh, and because Tel Slang is there, the killing fields are there. The the that kind of the high school they convert into like a, 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 a execution facility are there. You you end up really getting in in depth or embedded with the notion of what the Khmer Rouge was. And it's very present tense in Phnom Penh. But in Angkor, like it never came up, <laughs> other than don't leave the path, right? Yeah. Like, you talk to the people, and, you just, and never there was never really a conversation about the impact of the Khmer Rouge there. Instead, it was very much about the glory days of Jai Varman or Sri Varman, but it wasn't about the you know what the, the hit that they took under the under the Khmer Rouge. So I know that since you were there, they opened a landmine museum and I didn't, I wasn't wasn't able to go because it was like, I just, I only had so many days and I had other things I needed to do when I was there. And I had spent three days in Phnom Penh, like thinking about the Khmer Rouge and studying them. And, um, but they are, there are people that are there that are trying to bring more in, in, but I do think that people don't necessarily want to think about that when they're there. And I kept thinking when I was anywhere in Cambodia, if I'm looking at somebody who is over 40 years old, right? Mm -hmm. I'm looking at somebody who survived the Khmer Rouge and what they may or may not have done, which side they were on doesn't matter because like, unless they were a leader, they're pretty much a trauma victim. Um, And, and so wherever they are in life, they have done amazing work to get to that point because surviving that was nearly impossible. And when you were yeah. there, it would have been, you know, anyone under what, 25, <laughs> like 22. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so- I, pretty much. I mean, yeah. And, and then, you know, it's kind of like my first time in Germany, which was in 98, maybe 97. And you sort of, you, you know, your first time there and you're kind of like anyone over the age of 60, I'm starting to wonder, <laughs> You know, yeah, because you were old enough to make decisions back then, and um, you know, it, you feel kind of like that in Cambodia, but they're 
it's because it was so brutal and so awful. And I don't want to steal the thunder of that episode because that's going to be intense. Um, there aren't that many old people. At least they weren't when I was there. It was a very, very young country. And they're missing a whole generation of people in the middle. Like, they're missing, yeah. like, I don't know the exact percentage, but I would imagine, like, if I had to guess, like, 90% of people born 75 to 79, or people who should have been born, mm-hmm. when you combine uh, right. the fact that right. there just weren't pregnancies and the fact that babies were hard. It was hard for women to have babies. It was hard. There was no medicine if they did go into childbirth and then there was, if you starve a mother, how does she feed her child? Like, it's just like, it, like it's the difference emotionally for me when being in Cambodia versus being in Germany was that I didn't grow up hearing that, uh, Cambodians were bad guys. Right. So right. I didn't have to process as an adult. Like I had to process as an adult. Like what would I do in a situation like Nazi Germany? And you know, like who am I to be, so sure of the decisions that I would like, I like, that's just like a lot of like emotional work you have to do to get away from the idea that like, like a 17 year old boy forced to be a Nazi soldier. Like he's not really an autonomous actor, but there are people older and Germany is such an older, like that happened so much further in the past. Whereas Cambodia, I didn't grow up hearing stories about Cambodia. I didn't grow up. um, And also the Cambodian leaders were only hurting the Cambodian people. Mm-hmm. So it's like whether whatever side you were on, you were it was an internal hell. Essentially, it didn't come up right, and and a lot of it there's again the racism element too. If this happened in Europe, we would have known a lot more about it. But it's you know people in Southeast Asia. We've already spent a lot of time in Southeast Asia. We're tired of Southeast Asia. Right? Oh, absolutely. Like, well, think in the about same way that things that happen right? in the Balkans, it's like if something happened in the Balkans, you hear about it, but much less than if it happens in Western Europe. We have such a Western Europe, Canada, North America, United States bias right. that like it's just impossible even for things to break through. And I mean, like think about what's happening in Burma right now. <laughs> like, It's just yeah. like it's. Ah, I mean, I, I think it's important to talk about this stuff, but it doesn't I, – I, it's very rare for me to go on a trip and not have a day where I just cry all day thinking about things that happened. Tom does that. Oh, yeah. Tom Penn is – it is – I loved it. I love that city. Um, at the time I was going, it was so exciting and and, um, and waking up and the, the people in Cambodia were so kind and so wanting to talk and so um, enthusiastic about me being there. But again, 15 years ago – there weren't many of me there. And so it was, it was really a, a kind of a magical experience that way. But at the same time, there was nothing more uh, emotionally scarring oh, than, it's... than the killing fields. It is brutal. I mean, talk about 17 year olds being forced to join the Nazi army. We're talking about seven year olds forced to kill their parents. Yeah. Right. We're talking about people who had glasses being killed because they had glasses. If you spoke a foreign language, you were killed. And we're talking about they didn't use bullets because they didn't have enough of them. So they just bludgeoned people to death. Awful. It's so awful. And it's, um, I think that if you, if I was having this conversation with you 10 years ago, I would feel really optimistic about the world being a totally different place and like progressively getting better. And I do still big picture believe that the world, the like, uh, you know, like Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote that the arc of history bends toward justice. Like, I do believe that, but we are going through a scaling back of that where whatever, I think whatever um, belief I had that America could do something about a situation or that NATO could do something about a situation. I just like, I've just lost that a little bit right now. And so it just makes, I think it made hearing those stories so much harder harder on me personally than it would have like in you know in if it was a decade before because i just um when you see like the institutions that that are necessary like start to retrench because they just don't have the support that they need like that is just it's very scary and so like i mean i think that people are aware of the situation with the rohingya muslims in burma and we talked about it a little bit um on the episode that is well, right now you haven't heard it because it hasn't come out yet, but the episode <laughs> I recorded about Bangkok, we talked about it a little bit, but it's just, it's, there is, um, it's important to know these stories because it's important to be able to recognize when they're happening today and that um, they will continue to happen. 
right. and so you have to uh, if you want to consider yourself like a sophisticated moral citizen of the world you don't learn history because it's in the past you learn history because it's happening around you now and it's like like we couldn't do anything about the Khmer Rouge but you know it, we need to know about the with the Rohingya Muslims and what's happening there so it's just uh the world is dark, man. <laughs> Who would have thought this episode yeah. about Angkor Wat would be so dark? But um, Cambodia is a country that I loved immensely and I would totally go back at a heartbeat. And part of it is just that it has – its complications are more on the surface. It doesn't try to really hide them from you. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And it's um, – and, and I think they are so optimistic and so uh, excited about their future because the – horrors were so recent and the glory days they know they ha- existed right i think you can all, they, they fall back on that too and say look we were an incredible incredible civilization so we know we can do it again and we know we're on an upward swing and i think that really that energy you feel that energy when you're there um and uh their food's really good so no reason, <laughs> yeah so if uh, a listener was going to Angkor Wat, or I'm sorry, I keep doing that. Uh, it's okay. It happens to everybody. <laughs> so if, if a listener yeah. was going to go to Angkor today, I know that we talked about some of the temples, and I know that it's been a while since you were there, but what would you want them to definitely make sure to see? And and I say this because you kind of have to know what you want to see, otherwise you're going to get stuck on a path that's like a predetermined path. Which those yeah. are fine too, but if there's something special you want to see, you got to ask for it. Right, and that that is uh, that's really important. So you have to go. You're, you'll nowadays you can fly into Siem Reap. You don't have to fly into Phnom Penh and take a boat up. But uh, so if you fly into Siem Reap, uh, they have a nice new airport and they have nice hotels and it's the airport pleasant. is like super nice with yeah, really good Wi-Fi. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a world. Um, so. Uh, Definitely Angkor Wat. Get there early. And the advice I always give to anybody going anywhere in the world is get there early. Because a lot of people like to sleep. Don't be one of them. Not in Cambodia. Everything good to do in Southeast Asia starts before sunrise because it gets so freaking hot. Even in like, Mm. like, this is technically winter. And I have like a sunburn currently peeling from my last days in Southeast Asia. Get up yeah. before sunrise. Just it's just important. Do it. Uh, get up, and then uh, yeah. I had awful luck with sunrises and sunsets because there was just this haze. I was there in March, and there was just this haze over the trees, and so Aww. the sun would be there. I'm like, oh look, the sun's going down. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> like it wasn't. Like you couldn't really. It wasn't magical necessarily, other than oh, it's suddenly dark, and I've got to walk down this temple. So. Definitely see Angkor Wat, and I highly recommend getting a guide who knows their stuff, and they're available, uh, but who can explain what you're looking at when you look at all the galleries, because if you don't know the stories, you're going to have a real hard time like being able to say, wow, that's really cool. They're showing you know, guy making beer and, and the people doing cockfighting. <laughs> you're not going to know necessarily what you're looking at. The guide um- really helps. I, so I knew going in that like that was my option was to hire a really good guide or get a tuk-tuk driver and the tuk-tuk drivers will take you where you want to go. And that's ended up being what I did because I had to. Um, But if you are going to go and you have some time to plan, find a really good guide. And I have recommendations. One of my friends told me, she's like, you want this guide? And he just wasn't available. And I hadn't done anything else to try to get it. But I have a rec for a really good guide. So if you want to email me, um, if you're going, I will I will uh, send you this information privately. Because I, I don't have it off the top of my head right now. But, um, yeah, get a guide. is. And I, I did. I knew that I was going to miss it. And I did miss it. But I also knew that there was nothing I could do about it. It was too late. But don't make that mistake. Yeah, I had a really good guidebook, which helped. I... Just jumped on the back of a motorcycle guy, and cause they didn't even have tuk tuks when I was there. So oh, really? Animals. Oh my gosh! Motorcycles. Yeah, jump on the back of someone's motorcycle. When you're there, you will see um, like two thousand tuk tuks. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> Anchor changes. Yeah. The beer is pretty good, and so the um uh anyway, so I go on the back of the motorcycle, and then he um the the motorcycle guy, his brother, 
did the guide and for my friend and I and our friend and me. He was fine, but I would overhear another guide giving some English people uh, a tour. And I'm like, wow, that's the guy who really knows his stuff. Oh, yeah, I did that, that too. Guy I doesn't like, know his stuff. That I, guy is the guy who knows his stuff. I totally pretended oh. to be in different tour groups all day long to hear the stories of the bass reliefs because I didn't have somebody to explain them to me. And I know I didn't hear like as many as I should have, but I, that is, if you if you get stuck, you can't always just like be quiet and walk up to a big group. Yeah. So I I uh, definitely Anchor Watt um, without question. Um, get into Anchor Tom the city. Uh, don't just see the Bayonne, but see some of the buildings and structures around the Bayonne, like the, the remains of the palace and. And, and some of those other areas around there, uh, Taprom and Preya Khan. Um, and the other one I really liked was Takeo, which is a smaller kind of pyramid shaped temple mountain. Uh, it's maybe the first one. It was from, uh, um, well before Angkor Wat. So it's kind of cool from a historical standpoint. Uh, I spent three days there in the temples. Um, I went to Angkor Wat twice. Oh, wow. I saw it once early in the morning. I saw it once late in the afternoon because the light is different. And the, the morning light and the evening light just gives you a different view completely. Did you have any run-ins with some of the monkeys there? Because there's like a band of about 60 monkeys that basically run in core. And they're kind of jerks. And actually, I have a whole article on my website that I'm going to link to in the show notes about how monkeys at Encore are jerks. But do you have any? I saw a monkey steal a bag of fried rice for a like she like this monkey walked up to this woman, took her bag, took out the leftover fried rice in it, and started eating it. And then this local boy like started throwing sticks at the monkey to get it to run away. Wow, are they uh, friends with the ones on Gibraltar? <laughs> Probably. Because those guys are vicious. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't have any monkey run-ins. Uh, saw some. There are a couple elephants that were probably being mistreated yeah um, don't ride the elephants you shouldn't ride elephants ride anyway but don't definitely don't ride the elephants at anchor Wat. i don't remember much else they had, you know there'd be like random musicians playing a lot of the times yes with, uh, yes mine people who have been who had uh, been injured in mine accidents landmine accidents um and they would be sitting and playing music kind of like as an alms you know begging for alms basically um uh, at the end of the temples, but it would be beautiful um, and sad at the same time. Yeah, um, there were there were some of those. There were also some musicians that were just regular musicians. I'm sure that the economy there is, because the economy is so different, that the number of yeah. people I saw compared to the number of people you saw, like, like there are people, like, it's impossible to walk up to some of the temples without, like, 30 people trying to sell you stuff. But if you've been in, if, unless this is your first day in Southeast Asia is Angkor, you're going to be so used to that, it's not going to phase you. <laughs> right like it's just that's part of life there but yeah it's not the quiet um i would say if you want the quiet personal experience also try to go up to priya vahir um or uh the other unesco site that i mentioned sambo pre cook because you'll get that personal quiet referential experience that anchor used to be um and you'll also end up giving some money to another part of the country that needs it because siam reap is very wealthy compared to the rest of the country right so, Drew, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, remind listeners where they can find you, because they should definitely check out your podcast. So, it's called Wonders of the World. Um, you can find me at uh, wonderspodcast.com. You can search Wonders of the World podcast on any podcast device thing. Uh, uh, Facebook, Wonders Podcast, Twitter, at Wonders Podcast. So, uh, any of those places, I'm semi-active. But, uh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. You're welcome. I want to say thank you again to Drew for coming back on the show. If you like this show, you should definitely check out Wonders of the World because so much of the content overlaps, but if the formats are so different, I suspect anyone who enjoys the information on this show will definitely love his as well. Uh, housekeeping. So this is the last episode that comes out while I am in the Iberian Peninsula. I 
Uh, I should theoretically be in Sintra when this comes out tomorrow, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site in Portugal. So you can check out my Instagram account or my Facebook page if you want to see updates from the road. I've been really good about Instagram stories, updates, not so great about everything else just because of data connectivity. But I am History Fangirl on both, so you can check that out. And then if you haven't rated or reviewed the show on the iTunes or other podcast app of your choice, it would be a really great day to do that. Thank you so much for listening.